God bless you, family. God, it's your brother DJ Sam Rock right here on The Blaze, the Bible study, Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So you can set your alarm, your alarm clock uh, for 10 p.m. every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday for a live Bible study. If you don't have time to listen to me live, amen, then it turns into a podcast, meaning that you could download it, you could listen to it anytime, anytime that it's convenient to you. Maybe when you're on your treadmill, maybe when you have lunch break, school break, um, where, wherever and whatever the case may be. The Word of God is relevant to any situation that you may be facing. You know, a lot of times when I meet people and people greet me and I greet people, a lot of times the question comes up, hey, what's new? And I always tell people the day is new because sometimes um, the routine of daily life can be routine and it seems like every every day is the same thing but it's actually not yesterday was not today tomorrow is not today so every day is a new day but some people and I experienced this not too long ago some people are stuck in their old life stuck in their old ways they're stuck they don't know how to get out they don't know there's a way out they don't know what's the opportunity to live a new life that's why tonight I want to talk about what the Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 1 about a brand new life. The brand new life. There is a new life in Christ. There is a new life in God. It's just that our way of thinking, because before I knew Christ, my way of thinking was this is it. I have to make the best of what I have. I got to do the best I can to make this life the best it could be until I met Jesus. And once I realized that I couldn't do it anymore anyway, uh, it was a done deal for me. So once I got to the end of myself and I couldn't make the brand new life a reality in my life. So then the next option and the only option I knew of was to call out the God that everybody else was talking about that can change me and that could give me the new life. The brand new life tonight on the blaze. Go in your Bibles and, and we're going to be in Romans chapter 1. Amen. So let's pray. Let's get the atmosphere right. Let's set the, the, the mindset right. Let's get into a word with the Lord. Father, I thank you because you are Jesus Christ, the Lord. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you for listening to every single prayer that is raised up by people all around the world. Father God, I want to pray for the people who are being attacked for their faith around the world, especially in the Middle East, Lord God. I pray that you would show them that the brand new life that they live is worth it, that the brand new life they live is worth it, Lord God. I pray a hedge of protection over all the Christians right now that are suffering for the cause of Christ, that are not... Uh, putting down the gospel, that are lifting the gospel and lifting up your name. I pray for them right now in the name of Jesus, wherever they may be, wherever they might be going through, Lord God, that you will be with them through your Holy Spirit. I pray that every single listener of this Bible study will be touched in a way that you could only touch them, Lord God, that you restore, renew, redeem, give them a born again experience, Lord God, and let them know that they can live the brand new life. I pray this all by faith, knowing that you hear my prayers and you are faithful to answer according to your word. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen. The Brand New Life. The Book of Romans is one of my favorite books of the New Testament. The Book of Acts, because um, I'm into Indiana Jones and Star Wars, into adventure movies like that. I'm old school. Uh, Indiana Jones was, uh, that's just me. If you, if you know me, you know I think like Indiana Jones sometimes and I want to do things um, so adventurous. And then I stop and think about it. I said, wait a minute. I can't do that. But with God, all things are possible. So uh, but the book of Acts is like the adventures of the X-Men. Um, but in the book of Acts is the adventures of the first century church. And then, you know, there's signs and wonders, there's miracles, there's um. Demons getting cast out in the name of Jesus. Um, all kind of things happening. People preaching and thousands getting saved. I love stuff like that. And then, of course, Romans is basically the book where it tells us um, how to live a Christian life. The book of Romans was a message that Paul wrote to the Romans. Uh, he was letting people know that there is a sin nature that all people have to faith, uh, face. He explains how uh, forgiveness is available 
through faith in Jesus Christ. And it shows us in his letter what believers experience in life because of their new faith. Um, it's a book that explains uh, the Christian life. And because we can live a Christian life because of what Christ has already done, Paul wrote Romans as an organized and carefully presented statement of his faith. Uh, he spends a lot of time greeting people in Rome at the end of the letter, if you read the whole book of Romans. And it's for a reason. It's for a reason. And we're going to get to that reason. Because if we want to live the brand new life, we have to recognize that there's an old life that needs to be dealt with. God wants to take us out of our dark places and he wants to um, put us into his marvelous light, basically. So a brand new life, that brand new life of faith, only can begin when you place your trust in Jesus Christ. And you could put, instead of the word trust, you could put faith there. You could place your faith in Jesus Christ. Um, there are people out there who think Christians are, you know, we left our brain somewhere once we started believing that there was a God and Jesus Christ is God and there's a Holy Spirit that guides us. A lot of so-called, I want to say intellects, think that we're dumb for believing that that there is no evidence um that the bible is an ancient outdated book uh that god cannot possibly exist um then a question uh the question of evil comes up and i dealt with that in earlier bible studies before but can you imagine uh, a person living their whole life just thinking that there is no god and thinking that christians are totally out of space and then find out at the end of their life that they go, they meet a holy God at the end. When they die, they open their eyes and there it is, a holy God. And then what? I think at that point it would be too late. Um, and I'm pretty sure a lot of them must have thought, wow, I should have believed in those Christians. And not only those Christians, but the God of those Christians and that's always available. If you have breath, if you have ears to listen right now, you have an opportunity. God is not done with you yet. Um, I can't convince you or anyone that there's a God, but God does the convincing through his Holy Spirit, through his love, his grace, his mercy. Um, if you ask an atheist why they don't believe in God, um, the new atheists are saying it's not that they don't believe necessarily. They're just not convinced. Well, the convincing part belongs to the Holy Spirit of God. There's no way I can convince or anyone can convince a person there is God. If there was a way that I could convince anyone that there is a God, that means there's a way somebody could um, take them out of that um, at the same time. If you could argue somebody into the kingdom, that means somebody could argue you out of the kingdom. You could be argued out of the kingdom. So it's not about winning an argument or or you know winning a debate it's about what god does to a person who says you know what i want to place my faith and trust in you and see what happens from there it's the only way uh, that people could have a, a personal experience with a loving and holy god so a brand new life of faith begins when we place our trust in jesus christ and there's probably no other book in the Bible that speaks more clearly, more passionately, and more thoroughly about building a deep relationship with God than the book of Romans. Of course, the book of Romans was written by the Apostle Paul. Uh, some people call it the gospel taught to believers. And in this letter, there's a large church in ancient Rome, right? Paul set out to explain how the good news, the gospel of faith in Jesus Christ, this Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins and rose again by the power of God the Father, that right there can radically transform lives here on earth as we prepare for our eternity in heaven, right? There's a prep, there's a preparation stage. This is, this is, um, we're just passing by. But this is like a blink of an eye to God, our earthly life. But eternity is a real long time. So Paul called the gospel 
the good news of Christ. He calls it the power of God to salvation. And it's for everyone who believes. It's not just for the people in Rome, not just for Jews, not just for, you know, uh, people who live in the Middle East, which all this started from. But no, it's available to everyone who believes. And Paul declares that God is the righteous God. And if it's because of his righteousness, when that's revealed to a person, you go from faith to faith. Um, in the book of Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, the Bible says the just shall live by faith. Amen. Of course, Romans in the book, it offers a systematic look at God's plan to rescue us from our sin. And since I'm not going to go to chapter 2 or 3 right now, I'll just really quickly let you know that in chapter 3 though, even though we're going to go back to Romans 1, but in chapter 3, in Romans 3.23, everyone has sinned. So that puts the playing field even. Everyone has sinned. Your mother, your father, your cousins, your uncles, your aunts, the priests in the, in the Vatican, the Pope, um, you know, the bishop, the uh, bishop pastors, evangelists, prophets, teachers, everyone you know and everyone you don't know have sinned. So we all fall in that category. And also that our sin separates us from God. A lot of people say, well, I'm not going to follow God. You know, this is my body. Uh, this is my life. Really? But do you know that you cannot be separated by God other than through your sin? So you could try whatever you want to separate yourself from God, but um, the Bible says that we were created in the image of God. Um, therefore, if we we're created in the image of God, that means God owns, this is God's property, right? Our bodies. But God is so good and so loving that he doesn't force us to follow him. He doesn't force us to be a Christian. He doesn't force you and me to do anything. But he offers you the gift of salvation, the gift of the brand new life. He offers it to you daily. I think he offers to it, it to us every second that we breathe. Amen. Well, every time you breathe, just get, get, take a deep breath. You don't even own that. That was loaned to you by God. There's a joke of a scientist challenging God and say, okay, God I can do whatever you could do. So the, the rain, for instance, so. The scientist gets all the elements together. He makes the right temperature. Temperature forms a cl uh, cloud, humidity and everything, cloud, and then rain comes down. And then he said, well, this is going to be the showstopper. So the scientist tells God, I'm going to create man. And then he starts um, looking in the scriptures and he noticed that God created man out of dirt. So the scientist starts his experiment and he starts to gather the dirt from the floor. And God says, wait a minute. Use your own dirt. You get it? God owns everything. So because God owns everything, there's nothing that we can use to create another God or to defy God or to just eliminate God or just to say there is no God because everything we see and everything we don't see was created by God, for God, and through God. Amen? And it's just an amazing thing. People have more faith than me to believe in evolution or to believe that there's no God. That's way more faith than I could ever have because that's just uh, totally, incredibly uh, out of this world by thinking that um, something exploded from nothing came everything. Last time I checked on 4th of July, if you have a cherry bomb or a firecracker, when you light that thing, you throw it in the air, you throw it somewhere else because you don't want that thing to pop in your hand, right? Why? Because if it explodes in your hand, uh, your hand's going to fall apart and it's not going to come back together. Evolution says that there's a big bang. Some molecules formed up in an explosion and then out of the explosion came order. The planets, the stars, the moon, us. Are you kidding me? Uh, we need to rethink that. And these are so-called intellectual people, professors and people that are in universities and they say, yeah, that's that that's the the reason why we're here. And I could explain it and uh, thermal this and uh, all these big fancy words. And it's crazy because in Genesis chapter one, in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth right there. Science right there. Time, space and matter right there. 
in the beginning time god was the you know the force he was the uh, substance of it all the matter was the earth time space and matter that's what you need for science and science simply is the word for knowledge so anyway i don't want to go there i don't know why i went there so if you go to um, we'll be really quick in romans chapter 1 verse 4 i want to key on in this new life thing because we already know that paul uh is the apostle he's a servant of god that was used by god in a mighty way and is still being used by god today obviously because we're reading one of his letters to the church he wrote 13 letters to the church and here in rome um it was written about uh 57 a.d um, it was written from corinth paul was preparing for his visit to jerusalem so he wrote on um, this letter then apparently paul had finished his work in the east and he planned to visit rome on his way to spain after first bringing a collection to jerusalem for the poor christians there um, the roman church was mostly jewish but also contained a great number of gentiles and that will be us those who are not jewish so if you go to romans chapter 1 verse 4 uh the bible says well let's back you know let's just start from verse 1 paul a bond servant of jesus christ called to be an apostle separated to the gospel of god i love that the gospel of god which he promised before through his prophets in the holy scriptures concerning his son jesus our lord who was born of the seed of david according to the flesh and declared to be the son of god with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead romans 1 and 4 basically says that god loves to take the greatest tragedies of life and turn them into the greatest victories what does that mean the new life is because of the new life that's good is because of the old life that was bad in other words jesus christ there has not been any other gruesome or inexplicable or heartbreaking event than the crucifixion of our lord jesus christ and who was behind the crucifixion well uh, a lot of people say that the roman guards crucified jesus a lot of people say that the jews killed jesus uh, but the bible is clear our sins put jesus on the cross not because he had to because he was willing to but behind it all was the devil the devil showed up in genesis in the garden of eden the first thing the devil did was deceive God's first two creators, creations, God's first two children. He, he deceived Eve and Eve, because she was deceived, um, led Adam, her husband, into the same scenario. And because of that, sin, death, sickness, and all that, the devil was behind all that. He's responsible for all of that. God didn't place that on us. Uh, we placed that on ourselves because we disobeyed God's word. And I say we because if it was me, I would have did the same thing. If it was you, you would have did the same thing. Um, first of all, talking back to a snake in the garden, talking back to the devil, uh, is not a good thing. Use the word of God. The Bible says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will what? Flee. So the devil was behind the crucifixion. But the Bible says that ultimately ultimately god himself was the behind the scenes director <laughs> that's good so for one rare moment god the father and the devil were working toward the same goal although not for the same reason at the cross of jesus god took the greatest of tragedies and turned it into the greatest of victories in the same way god can accomplish his purpose in your life even though uh even through the activity of satan demonic trials and even temptations that we face can help us grow stronger spiritually that's one of the parts of the brand new life because you're saved and you're christian you're born again does not mean that the trials of life are just going to skip you by that there's not going to be no hard times. There's not going to be death in your family or sickness that you have to battle through. No, what the brand new life means is that now you have hope. 
and now you find yourself that you are not alone. Depressed people feel alone. I'd struggle with depression and sometimes you feel like you're alone. But the devil is a liar. Your flesh is really not um, lining up with what the Spirit of God wants to do. So we have to always know and rely on the fact that Jesus Christ said it is finished. There's a lot of religions out there that say you have to do this, you have to do that, you have to do good deeds, you have to accomplish all these things to gain favor with God and to gain access into heaven. Some religions say, well, if you do this, it's nirvana. If you do this, um, you have the, the the virgins and all this other stuff. But the Christian Christian life, the, the brand new life, the, the God of the Christian says that everything is done. God, through Jesus, did it. He paid the final debt. Religions say, other religions say, you have to do things. But Christianity says, it's done. See the difference? The brand new life, because of what Christ has done for us. And you find it in the book of Romans, chapter 1. Uh, let's skip to verse 16. Where the just shall live by faith. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For in the righteousness of God, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As, is it, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So we see that there's no, no need to be ashamed of the gospel. I know if you're young, I know teenagers, I see this all the time, teenagers and even um, in between ages, find, a, find it difficult to say they're Christian because of how the culture is going. Uh, we're being called haters because if the Bible says um, sexual morality is wrong, we say it's wrong. We're being called, now we're intolerant and we're haters because we're just repeating um, the report of the Lord. Amen. It was written thousands of years ago. Some people actually think, and I met some people that actually think we made this up. Like men wrote the Bible. Like it was a big conspiracy. And then I take them historically through the scriptures and say, well, you know what? In the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, uh, the prophet spoke of Jesus like 800 years before Jesus came on earth. So that would mean that if it was a conspiracy that Isaiah had to live at least 800 years to tell somebody else to connect the dots in the scriptures. That's a lot of faith. I started to learn that people who um, don't believe have more faith than me in certain areas by the explanations. So some people say that the Bible was written by men, uninspired men. I uh, got Because, you know, the Bible does say this was written by men, but inspired by, carried along by the Holy Spirit of God. But that's another Bible study. But to say that the Word of God was a conspiracy, it was written by men um, that were just planning um, to put a, a hoax on the whole world. Um, it's crazy. It's a crazy way of thinking. Because I know if I would have wrote the Bible, just me and my way of thinking, I would have made me invincible. I would have made mankind invincible. I would have took sickness and death out of the equation. Everyone would have been a millionaire. I would have set it up so lovely um, that it would have been great. Everything would have been writ written for our um, advantage. So if men wrote the Bible, like some people say, uninspired men, they wrote the Bible. Why did we put ourselves in such a bad condition in need of a God um, to save us and to rescue us and to to give us a need to have the brand new life. I don't understand. It wouldn't make sense for us to write a book um, and make us needy on anything else than ourselves. But of course, the Bible was written by inspire, inspired men of God. Men who were carried along by the Spirit of God. And God used them to write the mind of Christ. To write out the Word of God. Amen. And from Genesis to Revelation... If you read it, um, you're not going to find any contradictions, even though people say there are many contradictions in the scripture, but yet they can't even show you one. Um, then they go to YouTube videos and say, this is a contradiction of this. And then when you do a, 
And when you rightly divide the Word of God, you'll start noticing that there is not a contradiction. For instance, people say the Gospels um, contradict itself. Um, one disciple says that on top of Jesus' cross, it said this. And another Gospel, it said it said that. But when you put them together, it says one old sentence. And everything that it says between the, the disciples who said what was written on top of his cross, it was all told about Jesus. It was prophesied. It was spoken of him like that. And it just makes more sense. As a matter of fact, it helps us out even more to have more faith in God and his word because it proves itself. The word of God proves itself. So the old man, your old man, my old man, that means the way we used to live. You might be stuck in the same way of living right now. You might not know Jesus. But my testimony is where I used to live before. It was all about selfish goals and ambitions, uh, money, sex, weed, uh, all types of um, selfish desires and self-gratification. It was all about me and what I wanted. I thought I was in love, but actually I was um, selfish. I was only thinking about what would please me. wasn't thinking about anybody else but me. That was before Christ. Now, since 2001, December 12th, I get saved, rescued. God shows up, reveals himself to me, changes and transforms my life. Now I have to get this message out. I just feel I have to get this message out to as many people as possible before he calls me back home. So that's an amazing thing. It came from I came from being selfish and self-centered to now other-centered and Christ-centered. Because I always know um, what joy means. Joy, is joy, the letter J is Jesus. The letter O is others. And then the Y is yourself. So Jesus, others, then yourself. Um, and, that, and that order keeps me to be unselfish. I want to give myself away. I want to give this gospel away. Freely it was given to me. Freely I give. The brand new life. We see that for the wrath of God, and this is verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. In other words, we don't even have an excuse. Oh, how can I believe in God? You know, uh, my mom died. Look, my dad died when I was 15 years old. Do you think I was happy about that? 15 years old, no dad. God took him out of the equation. For what purpose, what reason? I'm starting to realize why now. But during his last year of life, he knew he had a terminal in illness, disease. He knew um, that it could possibly be his death. The last year of his life, all he would tell me was, when I go, when, when I'm not here anymore, you go after your heavenly father. It's like, my heavenly father? What in the world are you talking about? I used to call him Pops. I said, Pops, what are you talking about? He said, when I'm not around, you search after your heavenly father. Wow. So it made sense. Did I believe him? Absolutely not. From 15, when he died, all the way till I was 30 years old, I was still doing me. Not believing in God, not searching no God. Even though in between there, I had some religious experiences. I knew of the gospel. I knew of Jesus. I knew about him, but I didn't know him personally. I didn't know that he died for me. I didn't know that he's God in me. I didn't know about the Holy Spirit. I didn't know about the new and the brand new life. No. All I knew was about religious things that you could do um, to put a checklist, um, to put a check on your checklist and say, I did this. I went to church. I'm a good person. And I realized, no. When I put my myself up in front of the mirror of God's law, which is the Ten Commandments and all the commandments of God, I realized that I was... Um, in desperate need of a, a life change and that life change only came when I personally asked God for forgiveness and I personally asked God to change me and transform you the brand new life is based on the simple fact which is not simple in my my eyes but simple uh, for God amen but a simple fact that he died for you 
he was buried, and three days later he rose again. And that same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead is available to you. To all those people who said, you know what? I'm going to call out to this Jesus Christ. I want that brand new life because this old life, it just got me stuck. Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Financially broke, spiritually broke, uh, addicted to all kinds of things, um, not, a- not able to uh, be happy and experience joy. If you're, if you're there, you have an opportunity to leave that old life, to leave that behind, leave that same old, same old back, back there. And today, make a decision to trust in Jesus Christ. And how do you do that? Well, you have to get this right. You have to realize why you need to be saved. You have to realize that you you all have sin. Romans 3.23 says we all have sin and fall short of the glory of Christ. Why you need salvation? Well, you need a Savior. Romans 6.23. Well, how do you do that? How do I know? And how do I get to salvation? Well, you have to realize that Jesus Christ is the only one who can save you. John 14.6. Just repeat this prayer to ask Jesus Christ to save you. Father God, thank you for revealing to me that you spilled blood for me. And because of your blood, I know that that's the only way to a relationship with you. I acknowledge that I am a sinner. I need your forgiveness. I choose today to turn from my life, my old life, of selfishness and sin, and I want to be transformed into the brand new life. I know that you are Lord, and that you were raised from the dead, and I received Jesus Christ into my life to be my Savior and my Lord, to live in me and empower me to live in obedience to you and your will. In Jesus' name. Amen. Something like that in your own stilo, in your own style, the way you would speak to uh, your best friend because Jesus Christ can be your best friend today. Amen. I'm out of time. I'm actually over time, but I felt that was necessary for that one person who's listening that needed to say this prayer and to receive Jesus Christ and turn from your old life and receive the brand new life today in the name of Jesus. Amen. So God bless you. God keep you. Thanks for hanging out with me for the blaze. Until the next time, remember always that God, he's good. Peace.